as I mentioned, Waldo's question is a good segue to our, our, our next kind of segment slash draft question. Now you look at it and obviously we talked about the Bengals potentially looking at running back as one of their top picks this year, um, whether it's at number nine, if that's Leonard Fournette or whoever that may be, um, Christian McCaffrey even maybe, uh, whether that's in the second round, Joe Mixon, Alvin Kamara, a um, lot of possibilities, but there seems to be a little bit of a changing of the guard around the NFL as it comes to the the valuing of running backs. Now, you know, in the in the 90s and early 2000s, you wanted those those big plotting running backs, those guys you can give the ball 30, 40 times a game. Um, you know, your Emmett Smiths, your Sean Alexanders, your you know, the, li- the list is on and on. Um, Eddie George, all these big guys that, that toted the rock for a team uh, a bunch of times a game, and, and you can kind of uh, three yards and cloud of dust your way to a win, I guess. But um, this year, maybe it's because teams kind of saw what happened with the Falcons and the Patriots, the two teams in, the, in last year's Super Bowl, uh, that they have so many versatile backs that can help out in the passing game. Um, can do a lot of different things to help out a team. But it seems like this year there's a lot of talk of potentially a, a handful of running backs that can go in, in the first round. We're talking about Fournette, possibly Dalvin Cook, Christian McCaffrey, maybe even Joe Mixon if, if teams are that high on, on him. There's there's a, a bunch of players who could, who could potentially go in the first round and, and should be able to help a team right away depending on how they use them. So I guess I want to ask the question to you guys, whether it's the Bengals or just a national perception. Has after after leagues valued the running backs in the in the nineties and, and early two thousands, then the NFL changed into a quote unquote passing league, and um, teams rarely even used a second round pick on on running backs. Um, if you remember Giovanni Bernard in uh, in twenty twenty twelve uh, was the first running back off the board that year in in the second round. So um, now it appears that there's a lot of talk about the running back position kind of being in vogue again. So Scott, I'll start with you. I guess the question to you is, is this the NFL kind of changing its stripes again and saying, you know, we like these versatile running backs. We, we value uh, the position once again, or is it just because this class has a bunch of star players and this class is kind of an anomaly that, a lot of these guys may go higher than many other previous drafts. I'm going to say it's the latter. I think it's not that the NFL is moving more to running back. If anything, I think they're continuing to move farther away. And I think the versatility, the multiple running backs, the specialization of it, I think it speaks to lowering the value of them instead of increasing it. But I think this year you just don't have the elite prospects at the other positions, which means that if you're grading players as far as their overall grade, Guys who, uh, you know, as far as this year goes, the running backs are some of the higher graded players just because you don't have, you know, those elite quarterbacks. You don't have Cam Newton, Andrew Luck, you know, uh, Robert Griffin III. You know, you don't have the top quarterbacks up there. You don't have a whole lot of cornerbacks up there. We've already talked about offensive line. You don't have that up there. Probably no offensive lineman's going to go in the top 15. You know, there's no left tackle up there. You don't have uh, the run on those positions even – some of their positions, you don't have a lot of big defensive tackles. You, the, and even edge rusher outside of Miles Garrett, you have a lot of questions. So I think the positions teams would prefer to go, you just don't have that uh, those quality blue chip guys up there, which is why you're seeing uh, so many safeties going high, which is a position that I think the NFL doesn't value as much uh, unless they can cover. Because you, know, you don't have to make guys running, so you don't need that big you know, uh, David Fulcher kind of big guy up front. But you have multiple safeties possibly going in the first, you know, 10 picks. You have a whole bunch of running backs going high. And it's because there's just not, at least from my perspective, it's because you don't have the positions that folks want. Yeah, and, and this, aside from the first-round talent, running back is one of the deepest positions in this draft regardless. You could be getting guys in those middle rounds that, you know, in previous drafts might be, second, third round picks, but maybe you get them in the fourth or fifth because this is a deep class and there's so, so many star players at the top of the draft at that position. Edge rusher is also very deep, even though, as you mentioned, there are questions at some of those, at some of those positions. Uh, Connor, I want to ask you the same question and 
kind of add the caveat, you know, is this, is this also because these guys this year seem to be a bit more able to play three downs, um, be it catching, blocking, running, um, is this year the anomaly that that there's just going to be a lot of high picks because of the talent at the position? Or do you think that, you know, teams value, even though I, I mentioned the Patriots and Falcons and the guys they used were mid-round picks, but do you think teams are beginning to value that, that position a little more highly if they can get things out of them in the passing game aside from the running game? Yeah, I think it's actually an, it's, it's a, an interesting dichotomy because you have, like you said, uh, the teams that even though you see the Patriots and they are still uh, working out of tandems and all this stuff and teams are definitely swaying away from the, you know, the three down type of running backs who just carry the whole team on their shoulders. Though there's the exceptions of like Ezekiel Elliott's of the world, David Johnson, who, you know, can still do it. Um, but I think it's, I think it's interesting because you see like Benjamin Albright, for example, who's a, like, He's he's had a lot of good scoops. He just tweeted out like right before this show, Christian McCaffrey's going top ten. Put it in ink, and uh, someone asked him, "Well, does that mean he's going ahead of Leonard Fournette?" And he said, "No, like Leonard Fournette is going to be gone before that." So there could be potentially two running backs off the board before the Bengals even make their pick. Which for Bengals fans is great, but I think in this you know context, it's interesting that teams, despite their, I still think that that the teams even though they're not paying running backs anything and that running backs as individuals are definitely less valuable to teams, the position itself is still very valuable and teams love to use them. The Patriots, for example, they just signed Rex Burkhead uh, to that, you know, what was it? Three or $4 million. Most they paid a paid plus, I'm pretty sure. And then they just uh, today, I'm pretty sure maybe yesterday signed uh, Mike, Gillisley, who's on the Bills, to a that the Bills probably are not going to match because it seemed like they were paying him a lot more than the Bills were willing to pay him. That's, I think, $4 million uh, this year and then $2 million, I think, next year, something like that. So the Patriots are going to be spending a good, like, they're, 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 they're doubling down on the running back budget. They're probably multiplying it by, you know, a factor of two or three for the upcoming season. And they're running back. I mean, LeGarrette Blount led the NFL in rushing touchdowns last year. So, and and they had Deion Lewis and James White. And so they still have Deion Lewis. Deion Lewis is like going to be the number three or four guy on the team this year, which is crazy because just last year people were saying he's one of the most versatile backs in the NFL. So I think to answer your question, I mean, it's it's a little bit of both. I mean, there's players in this year's draft like McCaffrey, Fournette. Uh, Davis, Mixon, no matter how much you nitpick these guys, Cook, they're just, they're talented. They're, they're, like, people are, are nitpicking the heck out of Fournette and trying to say he's Jeremy Hill, but he's, I mean, Jeremy Hill in college as a prospect was one of the best running backs that we've seen in, in quite some time as a running back. So, you know, maybe he's different in the NFL, maybe he's not, but all these guys are still really immensely talented. And teams are very, you know, enviable of these players because, like we're seeing, you know, maybe, maybe this, this, uh, what Albright's hearing in, in, in that two Bengals or two players can be drafted at the running back position for the Bengals uh, might not be true, but he's been right a lot. And even if he's not, I mean, teams still really like the position and they, they value it a lot. So I don't know. It's interesting, but I think to answer your question, teams still do value the position, just not in a way that they used to. Whereas you used to have the guys like Adrian Peterson carrying the ball three downs every time, um, just teams pounding it up the middle. I think they still value it and they just value uh, flexibility, depth, and versatility a lot more than they used to. Yeah, and the, you, you mentioned the Patriots. Obviously, um, I think they just re-signed James White. You might have mentioned that. They re-signed James White to a, an extension. Uh, you mentioned Deion Lewis. They sent the the tender to Gillisley. And then they also obviously signed Rex Burkhead. So um, it's it's funny that not only LeGarrette Blunt, who is a very productive player and kind of gets these rental deals with them, um, is, is, I believe he remains unsigned at this point. Um, but they, they still invested pretty heavily in the position, at least in free agency. Um, I, I, I'm going to fence ride here, fellas. I'm going to say it's both. Uh, I, I think, you know, in the mid to late 2000s, when teams kind of de- started to devalue the position, I think part of that was because the rookie wage scale wasn't in place. And you see some of these running backs – that potentially only you only get three, four productive years out of them because of the beating they take. 
Well, now, now that the, the rookie wage scale is in place and players in the draft are much more affordable, I think teams are more uh, a little more apt if they see a guy that could potentially play at least two downs, maybe three, to use a first-round pick on him. And this year, this draft seems to be filled with guys who can do that. Uh, it, everybody has their taste. Some people love Leonard Fournette. Some people don't. Um, uh, Mixon is one of the more complete backs in the draft, but he's got a ton of issues. Uh, Kamara productive well i should say athletic exciting college production wasn't really equivalent to that um and then you know there's there's cook who is is very exciting as well couple of off-field issues and also you know teams also probably look at the amount of touches they had in college as they come into the draft because they want to try and maximize the deal they get with them but i think if you get a a productive guy in the first round that can give you you know, four or five years in that first rookie deal. Um, I, I think that's why teams are a little more apt now to use a higher pick on a running back in, in these recent drafts than maybe uh, a, f in a few years prior. And, uh, you know, unfortunately for some of these starting guys, as free agency comes after their first contract, they don't really get a lot of the, the love that some other positions do just because of the amount of touches they tend to get. Um, but, that, that's another story. So I, I think it's both. I think there's a little bit of a changing of attitude around the league in terms of running backs. And I also think that, you know, this, this draft is loaded at the position. And um, if some of these guys, a lot of the edge rushers, a lot of the defensive linemen, uh, maybe even a wide receiver goes in front of the Bengals and you, you're sitting there with Fournette, McCaffrey, maybe another wide receiver, it's, it's going to be interesting to see if they want to go offense um, if running back is truly on the table for them at number nine and, and uh, you know, how that'll, how that'll shape their offense for 2017 in the, in the next couple of years. Speaking of this year's draft class, guys, the we mentioned earlier, the quarterback class in this draft is a little bit weak. Uh, the, con the consensus best quarterback, I guess, in this draft is, is Mitch Trubisky. Deshaun Watson is also up there. Uh, a couple of other guys that are intriguing, but for the most part, there doesn't seem to be, as Scott mentioned, an, an Andrew Luck, a Peyton Manning, or anything like that in this draft. It kind of got me thinking. Now, granted, we have the 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 ability of foresight, the the you know the we could be able to look back and everything. But as we sit here today, and we've seen what Andy Dalton has done from 2011 through 2016, a couple of Pro Bowls. Uh, five playoff appearances, that sort of thing. Um, do you think uh, – wh where do you think he would fall if he were to come out in this year's draft? Now, if you remember in, in the 2011 draft, he went all the way to the beginning of the second round, and he went behind guys like Jake Locker, Christian Ponder, Blaine Gabbert, um, and then Kaepernick went right behind him. So, obviously, behind Cam Newton, he was the he's, – he's the second-best quarterback in that draft. Um, where do you think he would fall this year because of the weak class, Scott? Yeah, I think if he was in the draft this year, I think he'd still kind of be where he was, kind of that late first, mid-second grade, because outside of Cam Newton, I think a lot of the prospects this year are kind of comparable to what you had the year Andy Dalton came out in 2011. He is kind of your Blaine Gabbert type, the guy who – has all the intangibles. He seems to have all the tools, just hasn't put it together long enough as far in a NFL season. Uh, um, someone like Jake Locker is kind of like your Deshaun Kaiser guy who was fairly athletic, but not very accurate, had some throwing issues. And then you have a guy like uh, you know, the cannon arm, the Patrick Mahomes is kind of like your Ryan Mallett. And I think if you look at the guys this year, some of them compare, I think very favorably or comparable to some of the guys that came out when he came out. So I think if, Dalton as a prospect, and if we go back then, some of the what were he is someone who can step in from day one. He can play. He doesn't have a strong arm. He seems more of a game manager, game manager with an upside of quarterback maybe uh, Peyton Man or Pey Chad Pennington. Sorry, not Peyton Manning. Uh, <laughs> Chad Pennington type. Uh, you know, can step in. He's not going to hurt you, but probably isn't going to carry you. Uh, has done well against decent competition. Had just come off that big Rose Bowl win against Wisconsin when he was drafted. Uh, showing he was kind of a leader, kind of mentality. 
I, I think if he was in this year's draft, he'd probably be in that same situation. He'd be maybe um, slightly behind someone like a Deshaun Watson, but ahead of maybe someone like a Davis Webb or a uh, Brad Kyeth. So I think he'd end the day if he were put in this year's draft. I, I just think he'd probably be in that same situation. He'd be um, kind of like where I think Christian Ponder would be the same thing. I think those two guys were probably interchangeable in 2011 that you'll probably end in the first or early second. It just depends on as in, um, how many guys are taken ahead of him. Yeah, and it's it's a fair point, again, because we have the, the benefit of, of seeing what Dalton has done as a pro. But, you know, you look back to the scouting reports back in 2011, you know, uh, accurate, good leader. Uh, his stock really rose with that uh, the win in the, uh, in the Rose Bowl um, but before the draft there. Uh, I think, you know, maybe he was kind of a third-round pickish type of thing, and then guys started watching more more tape, and he started rising up. Dalton did, that is, uh, rising up boards. I like that you brought up Mallet because for those of us who remember, there was a rumor that apparently Marvin Lewis and Mike Brown – uh, excuse me, Marvin Lewis and Jay Gruden had to talk Mike Brown out of drafting Ryan Mallett at the top of the second round instead of Andy Dalton. Um, who knows where the Bengals would, would have been over the past couple of years had they gone that route. Um, and, you know, Lewis and Gruden got their way, obviously, and Dalton's been their guy. Connor, you've been um, a, a bit more on the uh, on Dalton's side than maybe some other fans, um, especially – for those of for those of you who follow Connor on Twitter, he uh, he really likes him some Dalton. Um, I, I don't know what you think about where he might land. Personally speaking, I think he'd probably be a guy that maybe uh, a team would trade up into the the early twenties, late teens. Maybe one of those teams that are in the second round, um, a team like maybe the Denver Broncos or Houston Texans or something like that would trade up that have kind of a quarterback need, the Jets, um, and, and maybe he'd probably be in the 20s for me, maybe slightly higher personally. Um, what do you think? Do you think he would be the best quarterback in this draft, or do you think he would still be kind of right around where he was drafted in 2011? Are we talking about Dalton as a prospect who we have the foresight to be like, okay, this is what he's going to do over the next six years or whatever? I mean, kind of. Uh, you know, you, or is it's, it like it's, him, like – it's kind of blend of scouting report from 2011, as well as, you know, he, he's been the second most successful quarterback in the 2011 draft to, to date. Um, this is a weak class. Do you think that his skill set would have propelled him as, as one of, if not the top quarterback in this year's draft? I mean, I, if I feel like it's slander kind of to talk about Dalton. Like if we knew what Dalton would become, uh, back in his time, then he would have gotten drafted. I mean, I saw a redraft of the 2011 draft a few, um, few like a week ago, a week or so ago. And even though I get like it was a stacked class, and you know there were a lot of good players, it was crazy that people didn't have Andy Dalton uh, picked higher in the draft. I mean, I don't. I'm not going to pretend in front like he's the best quarterback in the NFL. But but at the same time. He's a guy who, you know, when things have gone right, has been a great quarterback. Uh, past two years, he's thrown 43 touchdowns, 15 picks. His pass rating has been ni was 91.8 this year, 106.3 last year. He's, he's visually improved every single year of his career. He has one losing season. And I know QB wins aren't really a stat, but th that is, like, worth mentioning because he inherited uh, one of the worst big, teams in the entire big, NFL. Yeah, it's a big barometer for NFL quarterbacks, for sure. Yeah, for I mean, it's not a, a by any means gospel, but I mean, when you talk about a guy who you know plays for the Bengals, it's definitely worth mentioning. And then you have, you know, it. I don't know. People are going to credit his success to Green, but then you know he puts up good numbers even when Green's not in the game, and people still, uh, for whatever reason, don't like Dalton. I mean, I get I get why people don't like him, like in, in terms of there's things that he's not perfect at. But at the end of the day, you look at you know. You look at numbers like the past 10 Super Bowl champion quarterbacks, only Joe Flacco was a first rounder. It just doesn't really make sense that people are, t or like people are, are saying that they wouldn't want Dalton in the first round of a draft when, you know, you, you have a guy who is going to lead you to multiple playoff appearances, if not, you know, five and six years. Um, 
he's a good player and he knows what he does. I mean, he has he has obviously strengths and obviously weaknesses. He's going to do things well. He's also going to do things that frustrate you, like roll out of the pocket and force a pass or just throw a pass away as soon as he you know smells pressure. But at the end of the day, like I said, like I just feel like I'm reiterating. I mean, he's a good quarterback. He's thrown for he threw for 4,200 yards last year without AJ Green for half the season. So. And, and didn't he, have, he didn't have Eifert either. So, I mean, he, I don't know. I, I think it's so crazy that people still don't think Andy Dalton is a good quarterback. I mean, you might not have to, you don't have to love Dalton, but what he did last year without Green for half the year, Eifert for the other half of the year, um, it was impressive. And, and he didn't have an offensive line pretty much the whole year too. I mean, so I don't know. I like him. I think if, you, if, if teams had the foresight to be like, this is a quarterback who's going to, become what Andy Dalton would become, then they would, I think, no questions asked, draft him with him. I, Cleveland would take him right now at, you know, where are they, at 12? They'd take him at 12 easy. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, if, if you weren't going to mention the offensive line from last year, I, I definitely was. Real quickly then, since this might be, I guess it might be a little bit of a skewed question to your point, Connor. Um, just real quick, what about A.J. McCarron? Do you think he would be higher rated than a fifth-round pick this year? I, I mean, he'd be higher than a fifth rounder, but I think Bengal fans immensely overvalue what he brings to the table. I mean, people compare him to Jimmy Garoppolo a lot, but I think the difference between Garoppolo and McCarron is that when Garoppolo on tape, when you watch him, was one of the, like, he looked like a top NFL quarterback when he was on tape. And McCarron had some nice plays here and there when he was playing for the Bengals, but I mean, he he really didn't play all that well. Uh, he fumbled, he, he lost that really memorable fumble against the Broncos in that game. Uh, week 16 or seven, no, week 16 of 2015. Uh, he played really bad in the playoff game against the Steelers, like really bad. He had a late touchdown pass, which kind of bailed out his reputation. But I mean, that was a bad performance by far, like by, by all standards uh, in the playoff game. He had a couple of decent games, but again, like who were they against? The Niners who were terrible that year. And uh, I don't know, maybe a, a, a game or two more of decent play. But he played. He had a couple of nice games against some bad teams. Is he better than the fifth rounder? Yeah, he's probably like a third or fourth rounder. But yeah. I don't think he's going higher than the third round of this year's draft. That's that's what I would think too. Um, and you know, he did play pretty poorly in that in that wild card game against the Steelers. Um, I think he had at least three turnovers two i think he had two interceptions maybe and a lost fumble and then he had two other lost fumbles he fumbled that, a lot people yeah. forgot about how many times he fumbled I'm i think he up. i think he fumbled three times in the game and the, and the team recovered two after he threw i think two interceptions and lost another fumble um and then there was also the the giovanni bernard fumble on that questionable hit by ryan shazir obviously weather played a huge factor in that game as well um, Scott, real quickly, your thoughts on AJ McCarron, if he were to be entering this year's draft. Yeah, I agree with everything you and Connor say. I, I think um, we tend to overvalue him because the thoughts of trading him away, and we're like, oh, you know, if we trade him, we better get a first round pick. Well, who's going to give you a first round pick? I mean, we, and, and, and that's not happening. And, 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 there was a noticeable drop in talent as far as the crispness in the throws, the accuracy in the throws, knowing the offense. Granted, he was a lot younger. Dalton was in his fifth year. He was just kind of stepping in, trying to learn the offense. And his first year, he didn't exactly look that great. So it's hard to know in year three or four if McCarron may be better. But I'd say if uh, draft, it is a weaker draft. I, I, I can see someone taking him in the second round. Um, kind of. Uh, not not as the prospect he was when he was drafted, but I guess today I could see so equivalent of trading like a late second round pick for him, especially since it is a and if you are desperate enough, I could see a team saying, hey, he's been around for three years. If I knew I could get a guy who has three years of practice, practice experience, a handful of NFL games, yeah, I, I could, I'd rather have him than you know, someone who I could get in the second or third round. Yeah, um, I, I do think that this year he probably would have been – he probably would have propelled a, at least a round or two up. And I, I think even when the Bengals drafted him in the fifth round, some people were a tiny bit surprised that he lasted that long. I think, um, you know, a lot of people thought he might have been a, a day two guy, um, maybe fourth round, but uh, getting him in the fifth was was a good deal there. Good stuff, guys. I You know, just kind of a little hypothetical. It was, it was fun to think about. I know it's a little skewed question because you, we're talking about players who have taken NFL snaps as opposed to those who have not. So 
you know, use being able to use hindsight is is something, but um, just got the wheels a turning for me. You know, uh, this this is a weak class, so um, just food for thought. Let's let's end before we get to uh, fan questions. Let's end on one kind of fun question that's draft related, and and we can make it Bengals related. A lot of us like uh, we we have a lot of uh, favorite football movies, um, whether they're comedies, whether they're they're dramas or or what have you, uh, and they go they go back into the you know sixties, seventies, and and up to present day. Uh, if you think back to some of your favorite your favorite football movies, and you kind of tie in, you tie in the, the colorful characters that are in a number of those movies. Um, and you look at, we talked about the Bengals needs high in this draft, um, running back, wide receiver, defensive end, linebacker, um, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of different positions, maybe even tight end. Um, think back to your favorite, your guys's favorite football movies, some of your favorite characters and the positions they played in those movies what are a couple of players from movies that you think the Bengals would be drafting? Should they be in this draft class, Scott? Well, I know they, I'd say my favorite football movie has got to be Rudy. And Rudy was yeah, an edge rusher in that one play, but I would not <laughs> um, put Rudy, if I was picking someone, I would not grab him. Lock, locker room guy, locker room guy. He is, but I want someone who can actually go up against an NFL lineman. So the, the two guys who I thought of, the two players who I thought of were, I am a big proponent of us needing a kicker. We need a kicker. There are two movies I've seen that have people who do a fairly good job of kicking. One of them is I would either pursue Kathy Ireland from Necessary Roughness. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. Um, or there is a, a movie called Facing the Giants. It's one of these low-budget, uh, pretty gospel movies. You give your life to Jesus, and then you know everything works out fine. You never have a problem in this life, kind of. Anyway, there's at the end of the movie, there's a kicks a long game-winning field goal. So you have a guy who can hit long field goals under pressure. Now, granted, he had people praying for him and. You know, his dad was able to get up out of the wheelchair and because he believed in God. And, but, you know, he, he made a game-winning kick. How many times have we seen New Jack miss a game-winning kick? So I'm going to say either that, that field goal kicker from Facing the Giants movie or Kathy Ireland. Okay. Uh, there, there's another interesting kicker from the movie The Replacements. Uh, if you've seen that movie, uh, he is – a a guy from the United Kingdom, uh, very colorful character and pretty funny in the in the movie itself. Um, Nigel Gruff, if you remember if you remember him, blonde haired guy, uh, could kick the ball a mile. Obviously had some off field issues with gambling and and all of that stuff that got him into some trouble. But uh, that's another kicking kicking possibility. Uh, Connor, some some you're on the younger spectrum of this show, so maybe yours will be a little more from recent recent movies, but what are a couple of players from football movies uh, based on positions of need for the Bengals that if they were in this year's draft, you would like to see them, you would like to see them select? Uh, I only have like one movie, which I can really think of where there's people, which is the longest yard, the 2005 version with Adam Sandler, whatever. Um, and I would say, what's this guy, the great Kali or something like that. The, the former WWE or WWF, uh, you know, he played defensive end or defensive line, I think. In um, and uh, was he the guy the that Sandler Sandler played ping pong with? I don't know, but this dude was seven one and yeah, uh, yeah. three hundred forty six yeah. pounds. Uh, so give me that guy on the defensive line. I mean, he fits the Bengals mold. He's seven one. Yeah, and uh, he destroyed people. He also played fullback for him. I think he was, he was a lead blocker for him as well. So yeah, I haven't seen it in a while. So I mean, or give me stone cold, Steve Austin, Michael Irvin played someone. Just give me Michael Irvin. Give me Michael Irvin 10 years ago. There, yeah, okay. there you go. Yeah. I, I've got a few and uh, one is from that movie. Uh, it's a different player. I would go 
Tyler Meggett, the running back, even though he got hurt in the big game, uh, he was he was a stud in that in that movie. And actually, I believe Nelly has some in real life has some significant football experience in his background. Um, and he was he was shifty and could catch the ball. And I really liked him. There was uh, the linebacker. I'm, I'm trying to remember his name in the movie. Danny something uh, in the replacements. Uh, he was played by John Favreau, uh, an absolute menace of a, of a linebacker. He was, he, he, if you remember the movie, he was a former cop and um, ended up uh, playing his, he was Danny Bateman, I think was his name in the movie. Uh, just a beast of a linebacker and uh, really, really liked him uh, as <laughs> in that movie. He was, he was pretty, Pretty psycho. Uh, really liked him. Um, number of it, of other routes you could go. Um, I guess I would also say uh, if you want to again kind of keep it a little recent. Um, if you go, if you remember the movie, um, remember the Titans. Uh, there was also another linebacker slash kind of defensive end um, played by uh, Ryan Hurst. Uh, and he plays a character called Jerry Bertier, unfortunately, in the movie and in real life. That that person uh, not only was paralyzed, but then was later, uh, I believe, killed in a drunk driving accident. But um, Jerry Bertier was a was a high school All-American and a, and a stud as well. Julius Campbell, if you remember, the other guy on the other side was was another stud. So um, just, just a fun little question, obviously, kind of tapping into pop culture as well as tying it into the Bengals and the NFL draft as we're a week away from the festivities. So... Um, you can let us know, listeners, what you think uh, about the, the past couple of topics we talked about. Where would Andy Dalton go in the draft? Where would A.J. McGarren grow, go in this year's draft based on what you've seen from them so far and, and the talent in this year's draft? Um, is the running back position being uh, kind of back in vogue for the NFL and, and teams? Do you think they will – do you think that's a trend we'll start seeing, be it from Ezekiel Elliott last year to the guys this year? And what are some of your favorite football movie characters and who of those, who would you like to see on the Bengals if they were in this year's draft? We'd love to hear from you. You can get in touch with us via email, the OB insider at gmail.com on Twitter at Bengals OBI. Uh, you can, all of our contents on Cincy jungle. You can leave comments there. We're on iTunes. We're on SoundCloud. We're on YouTube and we're live on Cincy jungle and YouTube every week. So uh, if you're able to join us live, you can, you can leave a comment and uh, a question, that sort of thing. We'll get to it. We appreciate it. Having a little fun with the Bengals and the NFL draft so far.